What, if anything, do we remember about uh, about the Buddha's arguments about uh, about education as a process, its purpose? What have you? What's the goal that the Buddha argues we should be striving for? Or what's the goal he wants us to achieve? To be good. To be good, yeah. But it's a, it's a specific definition of good again, right? So what does it mean to be good from the Buddha's perspective? What does he regard as good? Nature. Does he regard human nature as good? What does he think human nature is? Remember, we're thinking, we're not talking about what we're looking at today, right? We're, we're just going back and reviewing where we've been, right? So we're, we're looking at the Buddha first, right? What does the Buddha think our nature is? What do we do by nature? And remember last time how we defined nature, right? Nature is essentially your given characteristics, right? Things that you did not have to acquire. The things we're all born with. So what does the Buddha think we're all born to do? Or born wanting to do? We're selfish. Yeah. That we are naturally selfish creatures, right? That we are born to strive we are born to desire things, right? And what does he argue we need to do in order to reach enlightenment? Do we embrace our nature or do we fight against it? Yeah. So you go against those currents of human nature, right? By practicing contemplation, stillness, meditation, right? So according to this philosophy, and this is going to be relevant to what we're talking about today, is the active life better or is the contemplative life better? The contemplative life is better according to the Buddhist frame of mind, right? Okay. Right, what Hannah Arendt calls the Vita Contemplativa, right? which is Latin for life contemplative. What about Mencius? What was Mencius' basic argument? We're all born good, but the world turns us bad. Yeah, we're born good. The world can turn us bad if we let it, right? But through proper action in the world, right, through proper ritual behaviors and proper social behavior, we can nurture and reinforce our goodness, right? So human beings are good right environment and action can make us better or worse right if we choose the wrong friends it can make us worse if we choose the right friends, the right teacher, the right ritual actions, it can make us better, right? So does Mencius seem to favor contemplation or action? What's more important to maintaining your goodness in the world? Action? Yeah, action here is more important, right? Because if you just stick with your given nature and don't do anything, you don't study, you don't um, you know, engage in social behavior, you don't throw yourself into um, social life, you're not likely to stay good, right? You'll end up like that mountain he describes that was lush and green, 
but is bare and rocky after people have stripped it for resources, right? Now, what about Sun Tzu? Yeah, he's arguing kind of the opposite point that Mencius is, right? That human beings are naturally evil. But do we have to remain evil? Yeah, right. We're born evil, we're born selfish, right? But we can learn pro social behaviors. Right? We can be taught to be good. Right? If we find the right teacher and perform the right actions. So, contemplation or action for Sun Tzu? Action again, right? Yeah, it seems like, by and large, the Confucian philosophy that Mencius and Sun Tzu follow is more action-oriented than contemplation-oriented, right? Now, what about Thomas Hobbes? What does Hobbes believe about human nature? What are human beings like in a state of nature, according to Thomas Hobbes? Now this is a little complicated, right? So it might help if we revisit it um, for a second, especially since um, some of us weren't here uh, last time. So at the top of page 82, where it says, nature hath made men so equal in the faculties of body and mind. What does that mean about the given nature of human beings? What does he mean, what are, what are faculties of body and mind? How might we translate that into something a little bit more contemporary? Like in physical and Physical and mental ability, right? And what does Hobbes say about everyone's physical and mental ability? It's all the same. Yeah, that we're, that at least in terms of potential, right? In terms of basic ability, we're all the same in terms of you know, body and mind, right? Some of, some of us might exercise more, develop our physical bodies a little bit more. Some of us might get better, better educated and develop our minds a bit more, right? But if we're talking about a state of nature, everybody's basically the same, right? Which puts everybody on a kind of equal playing field. Now, what happens then if everybody's on an equal playing field? What if two of us, who are more or less equal in all ways, want the same thing and only one of us can have it? Yeah, it creates conflict, right? Right, Hobbes' view of human equality is that equality creates conflicts. Right. <clears throat> if Abdul and I, for whatever reason, both want this book, there's only one book. Only one of us can possess it. So we have to either outsmart or outfight each other to get it without some outside force coming in to tell us what the rules are, right? So the natural state of human life for Hobbes is war. I capitalize it because he does. But it's war defined in a way that we don't usually use, right? In a, so if we look on page 83, he says, War consisteth not in battle only or the act of fighting, but in a tract of time wherein the will to contend by battle is sufficiently known. So to break this down into plainer language, right? Basically, war is competition and contention between people. 
That is what he means by war. So if this is what he means by war, then what does he mean by peace? No conflict. Yeah. Peace is the absence of conflict. And if all of us are more or less equal, and everybody is constantly striving to fulfill their own ends at the expense of everybody else. How do we get to peace? How does Hobbes think we get peace? Who has to, who or what has to impose it? An authority. Yeah, we have to sacrifice some of our rights to some authority figure in order to maintain peace, right? And why is peace necessary? Why do we need peace? What can't we have according to Hobbes without peace? So look on page 83, uh, bottom of the page. Whatsoever therefore is consequent to a time of war, where every man is enemy to every man, the same is consequent to the time wherein men live without other security than that which their own strength and their own invention shall furnish them withal. So in a state of war, the only security we have is what we can secure, security we have is what we can secure for ourselves with our own bodies and minds, right? In such condition, there is no place for industry because the fruit thereof is uncertain, and consequently, no culture of the earth, no navigation, nor use of the commodities that may be imported by sea, no commodious building, no instruments in of moving and removing such things as require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society. So what sorts of things are absent from a society that is in a state of war? What can't you have if you have a society that is in a state of war? You can't further your society Yeah, you basically can't have a society, right? You can't have trade, you can't have farming, you can't have building, you can't have industry, you can't have learning, you can't have art, right? So society is dependent for Hobbes on peace and on security, right? So if we had to sum up a theory of uh, education for Hobbes, right, it's that you can't have anything, education included, unless you first have security, right? So does this seem to fit cleanly into an active contemplative binary? I mean, I guess you could say that you secure peace through action, right? But one of the things that peace secures is the possibility of contemplation, right? You don't have the possibility of a contemplative life without first action, right? So the two seem to be related. Now, this is all important to think about here because the whole basis of Hannah Arendt's argument has to do with this divide between action and contemplation, right? The two key terms that she discusses, or that she uses um, to build her argument, are these Latin words Vita activa and vita contemplativa, right? Life of action versus life of contemplation. 
Which does she seem to think Western philosophy has traditionally favored? Which has been preferred? Via Contemplativa? Contemplativa. Yeah, she argues that through the history of Western philosophy, the Vita Contemplativa has been held up as the example, and the Vita Activa has been held in contempt, right? So let's see how she lays out this argument and <clears throat> relates it to social structures. And we all get what the difference is between an active life and a contemplative life, right? What does it mean to live a, contempl a life of contemplation? It is a more cautious life, right? How connected to you, how connected are you to worldly achievement and worldly activities if you're living a contemplative life? It's what's sometimes also referred to as a life of the mind. So it might help if we look at what Arendt says about this. She's describing Aristotle and Aristotle's three ways for a free person to live. Right? If we look on page 88, right? Aristotle distinguished three ways of life by way by which men might choose in freedom, which men might choose in freedom, that is, in full independence of the necessities of life and the relationships they originated. So what does it mean to live in full independence of the necessities of life? What does that mean? If you live in full independence of the necessities of life, Have you ever heard the phrase, like, a person of independent means or of independent fortune? Does that ring a bell for anybody? Sort of? Do you, do you know what it means? Like, you don't really need others, I guess? Yeah. Yeah, somebody who has independent means, right, is somebody who doesn't need to work for a living, right? So freedom, in the traditional Western philosophical men, uh, sense, has often meant freedom from work. And a lot of this is because our, our concept of freedom originated in slaveholding societies, right? Like ancient Greece, ancient Rome where any kind of real labor, any kind of hard labor, was done primarily by people who were literally not free, right? Free people, you know, didn't herd sheep. That was a job for a slave. Free people didn't, you know, build the Colosseum. That was a job for slaves, right? Free people didn't labor. If you had the labor, even if you weren't a slave, it meant that you weren't really free. So the Roman word for freedom, the Latin word for freedom is liber, which we can still see in the term, right, liberal arts, right, that is the arts and sciences that are appropriate learning for a free person, right? Free here again means someone who doesn't need to work. The, this prerequisite of freedom ruled out all ways of life chiefly, chiefly devoted to keeping oneself alive. Not only labor, which was the way of life of the slave, who was coerced by the necessity to stay alive and by the rule of his master, but also the working life of the free craftsman and the acquisitive life of the merchant. In short, 
it excluded everybody who involuntarily or voluntarily, for his whole life or temporarily, had lost the free disposition of his movements and activities. So freedom is something that is only open to people who have essentially boundless free time, right? By this definition. The remaining three ways of life have in common that they were concerned with the beautiful, that is with things neither necessary nor merely useful. The life of enjoying bodily pleasures in which the beautiful, as it is given, is consumed. So a kind of sensual life, right? Right, where all you do <coughs> is please your senses. The life devoted to the matters of the polis, in which excellence produces beautiful deeds. So essentially here, like what's, what, what, what word that we use today comes from the Greek word polis? Polis meant city. Polis, yeah, P-O-L-I-S. It's a Greek word that means city. What modern English word is descended from this word? I'll give you a hint. Uh, it's an election year, so a lot of people are either too eager or really reluctant to talk about politics. Yes. So the second thing that <clears throat> Aristotle describes as appropriate for the second way of life that Aristotle describes as appropriate for a free person is political life. Right? You have the free time to engage in matters that deal with the welfare of the people in the state, right? And the third is this life of the mind, right? This purely contemplative life in which you basically spend your day thinking and writing deep thoughts, right? Right, so the life, in this case of, you know, kind of the selfish egoist, in this case, right, the life of the politician, or the life of the scholar. Right? These are the pursuits that are available to a free person, according to Aristotle. None of which involve getting your hands dirty with the active life of labor and commerce. Because if you're free, you don't need to do that, right? Now remember, this is not Arendt's own point of view. She's quoting Aristotle here, right? So this all comes from the Greek philosopher Aristotle. And what Arendt is trying to do is rescue this idea of the vita activa that has been denigrated in the Western philosophical tradition. Right? So mo much of what she's doing here is tracing the history of this idea, how it comes to be disregarded, and then trying to bring it back. Right. So if you look at the top of page 89, The chief difference between the Aristotelian and the later medieval use of the term is that the bios politicos, right, the political life, this you know, number two here, stress, stressing the action, praxis, uh, or, uh, but, uh, sorry, denoted explicitly only the realm of human affairs, stressing the action, praxis, needed to establish and sustain it, right? So we can determine from context that praxis means what? Yeah, praxis means action. And this is a key component, guys, of active reading, right? Whenever you run across a word or a term that is unfamiliar, 
See if you can figure out how it's being defined from context, right? If you can't, what should you do? Or you can look it up, right? <laughs> and then if you still don't understand the definition, then you can ask me in class, right? But the first, yeah, the first thing, you, first thing you should do, right? Try to you know, you know, see if you can define it using context. If you can't, look it up. And if you still don't understand the definition, then ask me. Neither labor or, or work was considered to possess sufficient dignity co to constitute a bios at all, an autonomous and authentically human way of life. Since they served and produced what was necessary and useful, they could not be free, independent of human needs and wants. So, <clears throat> The vita activa, she says, is not even is not regarded as a sufficiently human way of life here. Because it's focused primarily on mechanical labor, right? On providing the kinds of things that people living these other kinds of life where they're pursuing the beautiful in their particular ways, um, depend on but don't have to participate in, right? That the political way of life escaped this verdict is due to the Greek understanding of polis life, which to them denoted a very special and freely chosen form of political organization, and by no means just any form of action necessary to keep men together in an orderly fashion. So why is politics not work? For the Greeks, why do, the, why, do, why do the Greeks not regard politics as work? Why does it escape this vita activa definition, even though it does involve running worldly affairs? What's special or different about the way the Greeks view this kind of participation? You might actually need a little bit of context for this too. Like, what do you guys know, if anything, about ancient Athens? Pardon? So big as a big like uh, so as a big whole like Roman like Greek. Okay, yeah, it was yeah, a very important Greek city-state, right? Um, it's one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities on Earth. What was different about Greece in the ancient world? Or not about Greece, but Athens in the ancient world. What was unusual about Athens in terms of its politics? Wasn't it more like democratic than most people? Yeah, it was a participatory democracy, right? So instead of having elected officials, like in a republic or kings, at least for a period in its history, all male free citizens of a certain age voted on matters of civic importance, right? They voted on whether to go to war or not. They voted on whether to provide public welfare for this or that project, right? Uh, they voted on matters of taxation. They voted on um, whether or not they should execute Socrates for corrupting the youth, right? Things of that nature. Um, so what she's saying was different about Greek politics that excludes it from this definition of the vita activa is that it was voluntary. Right? Participation in political life was a voluntary activity undertaken by aristocrats, right? Undertaken by the rich, by the elite. Right, they could choose to pursue truth in this fashion rather than through, you know, living a life of beauty or uh, the life of a scholar, right? Not that the Greeks or Aristotle were ignorant of the fact that human life always demands some form of political organization, 
and that ruling over subjects might constitute a distinct way of life, but the despot's way of life, because it was merely a necessity, could not be considered free and had no relationship with the bias politicos. So, what's a despot? You guys know what a despot is? Uh, no, a despot isn't a slave. What's pardon? What did that word originate from? Um, you know, I'm actually not sure of its etymology, but a despot is an authoritarian ruler. So, is it an authoritarian ruler? Yeah. So, authoritarian rule falls under this definition of the active life because it's work. Right? It's not something that is undertaken necessarily voluntarily. Right? The participants in the authoritarian government are doing something more like a job. <clears throat> They're not free. Even though the ruler can impose his will on everyone, right? He's still not regarded as free because he's doing the work of political organization. Okay, everybody's still with me. Does anybody have any questions so far? Anybody confused about anything? So we're all getting, right, that what Arendt is identifying in the history of Western thought is a tendency to value the life of thought and contemplation over the life of activity because of essentially who was doing the working, right? That elites were permitted to simply think or be, while ordinary schlubs were doing all the work that supported that elite class, right? With the disappearance of the ancient city-state, Augustine seems to have been the last to know at least what it once meant to be a citizen. The term vita activa lost its specifically political meaning, meaning and denoted all kinds of active engagement in the things of this world. To be sure, it does not follow that work and labor had risen in the hierarchy of human activities and were now equal in dignity with a life devoted to politics. It was rather the other way around. Action was now also reckoned among the necessities of earthly life, so the contemplation was left as the only truly free way of life. So as the ancient world gives way to the Middle Ages, these other two ways of life, the you know, sensual or artistic life and political life, become work. And thus, become associated with the Vita Activa, not the Vita Contemplativa, right? So the only true free way of life for medieval, you know, for medieval thinkers was this life of the mind or the scholar, right? Hence, the preference of medieval Christians for monastic lifestyle. It's saying, you know, this is why so many people join monasteries, right? A monastery was a place where you were completely disconnected from worldly things and worldly cares, right? So medieval Christianity celebrates monasticism. A completely inactive life, right? However, the enormous superiority of content contemplation over activity of any kind, action not excluded, is not Christian in origin. We find it in Plato's political philosophy where the whole utopian reorganization of polis life is not only directed by the superior insight of the philosopher, but has no aim other than to make possible the philosopher's way of life. Aristotle's very articulation of the different ways of life, in whose order the life of pleasure plays a minor role, is clearly guided by the ideal of contemplation. To the ancient freedom from the necessities of life and from compulsion by others, the philosophers added freedom and surcease from political activity 
So the later Christian claim to be free from entanglement in worldly affairs, from all the business of this world, was preceded by and originated in the philosophic apolitia of late antiquity. What had been demanded only by the few was now considered to be a right of all. So we're actually seeing something similar to a Buddhist goal developing in here, right? A kind of freedom from worldly affairs and worldly things. And one thing that Arendt argues Christianity does is kind of democratize that, right? That you don't have to be an elite anymore to follow this kind of monastic lifestyle of worldly rejection. Right? This is something that can be open to anybody and is regarded as the ideal for everybody, right? The medieval Christian ideal is a rejection of things of the world. Right? That's how you get your good place in the afterlife. So, <clears throat> what I want to do with this next paragraph, right? I want you to see if you can see if you can see, uh, detect a binary here around which this is organized, right? So, page page ninety. Let's just all go through this together for a minute, right? See if you can find any implied binaries in this. The term vita activa, comprehending all human activities and defined from the viewpoint of the absolute quiet of contemplation, therefore corresponds more closely to the Greek ashkolia, unquiet, with which Aristotle designated all activity than to the Greek bios politikos. As early as Aristotle, the distinction between quiet and unquiet between an almost breathless absten abstention from external physical movement and activity of every kind is more decisive than the distinction between the political and the theoretical way of life because an event it can eventually be found within each of the three ways of life. It is like the distinction between war and peace. Just as war takes place for the sake of peace, thus every kind of activity, even the processes of mere thought, must culminate in the absolute quiet of contemplation. Every movement the movements of body and soul, as well as of speech and reasoning, must cease before truth. Truth, be it the ancient truth of being or the Christian truth of the living God, can reveal itself only in complete human stillness. So what binaries do we see this paragraph as arguing? Like what, what two ideas seem to be put in conflict with each other? Quiet and unquiet. Quiet and unquiet are the, the big ones, right? And what does she associate with, which of these two terms does she associate each of these with? Which, which is the quiet and which is the unquiet? The quiet is my activity and quiet is my Yeah. The vita contemplativa is associated with quiet. And the vita activa is associated with unquiet. And which does she say has traditionally been the goal in Western societies? What, what, what is, is the... What, which has been preferred, the quiet or the unquiet? The quiet. Yeah, the quiet has been elevated, right? The quiet is what has been favored. And we can see this even in Thomas Hobbes' political philosophy, right? What, Ho what Hobbes was aiming for was quiet and security, right? You wanted people to stop doing things. You wanted, to be, or at least, stop doing things that were unproductive, right? Stop arguing with each other and just sit and be quiet, while some authority directs them. So, <clears throat> quiet and contemplation are associated with each other. Unquiet and action are associated with each other. Traditionally, and up to the beginning of the modern age. The term vita activa never lost its negative connotation of unquiet. As such, it remained intimately related to the even more fundamental Greek distinction between things that are by themselves, whatever they are, and things which owe their existence to man. So what's the distinction that's implied? Is there a binary implied in that sentence? How might we rephrase distinction between things that are by themselves, whatever they are, and things which owe their existence to man. What do we call something that owes its existence to human activity? 
that humans had to make? Okay, you got products, right? Think about this in terms of like ingredients. Artificial. Yeah, artificial, yeah. Artificial ingredients are things that have been synthesized in a lab, right? And what do we usually oppose to artificial? What's the opposite of artificial? Natural. Yeah. So she introduces here an artificial versus natural binary. So let's sort of look through the rest of this and see which side of this she seems to favor. The artificial or the natural, right? The primacy of contemplation over activity rests on the conviction that no work of human hands can equal in beauty and truth the physical cosmos, which swings itself in changeless eternity without any interference or assistance from outside, from man or God. So which of these two things does he associate with the artificial and which with the natural? Does artificial fall into the Vita Activa column or the Vita Contemplativa column? Yeah. Right there with unquiet, right? So natural falls in with the Vita Contemplativa, right? And traditionally, accompanying the Vita Contemplativa has been this idea that <clears throat> the world as it is, the cosmos as it is, is more beautiful and more wonderful than anything made by human hands. Right? So again, kind of denigrating that notion of action as artificial. Right? Human beings can't make anything that's as good or as beautiful as the cosmos itself, as it exists in its natural state. This eternity, this eternity discloses itself to mortal eyes only when all human movements and activities are at perfect rest. Compared with this attitude of quiet, all distinctions and articulations within the via, Vita Activa disappear. Seen from the viewpoint of contemplation, it does not matter what disturbs the necessary quiet as long as it disturbed, as long as it is disturbed. So what other word here is associated with the Vita Activa that we tend to consider negative? Disturbed, disturbed. yes, good. So the Vita Activa is here seen as a, you know, as a disturbance of contemplation, right? Action, doesn't matter what kind of action, doesn't matter what it is breaks up the stillness and the quiet that you need to contemplate the beauty and truth of the universe. Right? You can't contemplate the beauty of creation in perfect stillness if your kid is tugging on your leg wanting to watch the fucking Teletubbies, right? You can't contemplate the universe in perfect stillness if you have to go work a shift at Wendy's, right? Whatever action is necessary to perform to sustain human life is a disturbance to the contemplative life. Which is why the Vita Activa in the ancient world was traditionally outsourced to slaves, craftsmen, and merchants, right, who were not considered free. Traditionally, therefore, the term Vita Activa receives its meaning from the Vita Contemplativa. Its very restricted dignity is bestowed upon it because it serves the needs and wants of contemplation in a living body. So, what, we're say what she's saying here, right, is that this is the side of the binary that is sort of defined and positive traditionally. 
and that this is really more the absence of contemplation, right? Activity is the absence of contemplation and exists only to serve contemplation. rather than the other way around. Christianity, with its belief in a hereafter whose joys announce themselves in the delights of contemplation, conferred a religious sanction upon the abasement of the Vita Activa to its derivative, secondary position. But the determination of the order itself coincided with the very discovery of contemplation as a human faculty, distinctly different from thought and reasoning, which occurred in the Socratic school and from then on has ruled metaphysical and po political thought throughout our tradition. So to give you some sense of what she's talking about here, did any of you in high school or in another class uh, have to read uh, Plato's Allegory of the Cave? Are any of you familiar with this at all? Okay, so the Greek philosopher Plato argued that everything we see in the physical world, right? Everything that we can experience with our senses is just an inferior copy of something that exists in a realm of ideas, right? So I can make a table because some ideal table exists that I can access with my imagination, right? You know, there, there's a sort of, you know, there's a world of forms or models that we can draw on to make or shape things in the physical world. But the things in the physical world are always inferior to the things that exist in the world of ideas. So Plato is, one of, is essentially one of the first to articulate this preference for the life of thought, right? Over a life active in the physical world. Right, because he believes everything in the physical world to be inferior to some idea, right? It's just an inferior copy of an idea. Does that make sense to everybody? You don't have to buy it, but everybody understands it? Okay, good. So that's what she's referencing here, is this, this idea of Plato's. If, therefore, the use of the term vita activa, as I propose it here, is a manifest contradiction to the tradition, it is because I doubt not the validity of the experience underlying the distinction but rather the hierarchical order inherent in it from its inception. This does not mean that I wish to contest or even to discuss, for that matter, the traditional concept of truth as revelation, and therefore something essentially given to man, or that I prefer the modern age's pragmatic assertion that man can know only what he makes himself. My contention is simply that the enormous weight of contemplation in the traditional hierarchy has blurred the distinction and distinction and articulations within the Vita Activa itself, and that appearance is notwithstanding. This condition has not been changed essentially by the modern break with the tradition and the eventual reversal of its hierarchical order in Marx and Nietzsche. It lies in the very nature of the famous turning upside down of philosophic systems or currently accepted values that is in the nature of the operation itself that the conceptual framework is left more or less intact. So this is essentially where she's laying out what her argument is, right? What is her objection to the way the Vita Activa has been discussed by prior thinkers? What does she, what does she think that that's blinded us to? Pardon? Uh, think about it in terms of the actual words that she uses here, right? What, 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 uh, what, what is meant by this word hierarchy? What's a hierarchy? A hierarchy. Is a hierarchy, well, there are higher and lower powers within a hierarchy, right? What, is it, what specifically is a hierarchy? It's like a flow of power. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, yeah, like a, it's, a, it's a power structure, right? So if you think of like um, the way the Catholic Church is organized, right? You've got you know a pope at the top. You've got cardinals below him. You've got bishops below them. P 
priests below the bishops, and then everyday parishioners, right? Lay people below the priests, right? You've got a, you know, a defined power structure here, right? Where there's, you know, clearly someone at the top and someone at the bottom. So, hierarchically, what has been the relationship between the Vita Activa and the Vita Contemplativa? Exactly. And what has that made us not pay attention to about the Vita Activa? The fact that we've always regarded the Vita Contemplativa as better in the hierarchy. What has that led us to miss or to ignore in the Vita Activa? My contention is simply that the enormous weight of contemplation in the traditional hierarchy has blurred the distinctions and articulations within the Vita Activa itself. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah, that we haven't bothered to outline what the Vita Activa actually is, what its actual parts are because we've always just viewed it as this subservient thing that makes the Vita Contemplativa possible, right? So what she's arguing for is that we should refocus our attention on the active life, break down what the parts of that are, and rethink this relationship in which the life of contemplation is always on top, right? Simply being served by the active life. What happens if we flip this over and put the contemplative life on the bottom? So let's see if we can break this down into any kind of theory of education. How easy it is, is it to answer any of these questions with what a rent has given us here? Because by and large, what she's given us is a division of two different kinds of knowledge, between two different kinds of knowledge, right? There's active knowledge, useful knowledge, that allows you to do things in the world, and there's the contemplation of truth, right? And what's necessary if you are going to sit and contemplate the truth? The afterlife. Yeah. But someone else has to be living it, right? Someone else has to be living that Vita Activa in order for you to be able to sit in, in still, stillness and contemplation, right? So. What do you think Arendt would say the purpose is of an education? What does all this imply about traditional education? So if the Western tradition of thought has always favored this contemplative, unworldly life, Where was I going with this? Okay, if the Western tradition of thought has always favored this contemplative unworldly life, and the university system that we're all kind of enmeshed in 
is built on this Western tradition of thought. What then is she challenging by trying to make us rethink this connection between the active life and the contemplative life? Well, I think that's what you Yeah, I mean, that, that, yeah, that could be part of it, right? But I think, yeah, to, to rethink, yeah, at the very least, whether or not these things are actually so disconnected from each other, right? And whether one should have to simply serve the other, right? You know? So I, I think what she is trying to get us to think about is whether the structure of the Western system of thought and of education basically puts some people at a constant disadvantage, right? By always devaluing the life of action and always elevating the life of contemplation. Right, because not everybody can sit in contemplation, right? If everybody just sits in contemplation, what happens to society? Yeah, yeah, no one, no one does any work then, right? But it's not fair to delegate all of the work to one particular class of people, right? It's not fair to insist that only one group of people is suited for work and activity, while these other people get to sit and think, largely due to an accident of birth, right? So yeah, what she is trying to do here is question the premises on which our educational systems are built. That work, that activity, doesn't necessarily mean the absence of thought, right? And the contemplation should not necessarily be quite so disconnected from work, right? So what you might try to do with this if you were going to try to unpack it in an essay, right, is sort of think about how this, you know, exactly what we've been talking about here, and how these ideas of activity and contemplation are related to what goes on in our educational systems, right? I think it's important to say, too, that, uh, you know, Arendt is writing in the early 1950s, and there aren't as many departments of, like, anything applied in universities then as there are now. Right? So there aren't really a lot of business, business departments aren't a big thing yet. Um, nursing departments, departments of education, things like that, right? More, most college students, most university students are taking traditional liberal arts subjects at the time. So, um, does anybody have any questions about this? A lot of you are still looking a little bit blank and confused. So, do you need a minute to let it sink in? And, you know, I, I, I do just want to give everybody, too, before I let you go, just, you know, I know, like, a couple of these readings have been particularly difficult, so I do just want to, you know, give people a couple of tips for active reading here, too, right, so that you can make more sense out of these yourselves. So, the tip I gave you earlier about figuring out definitions from context, right, that's one thing you can do, right? Every time you see an unfamiliar word or an unfamiliar term, Try to work out what it means. Right, always, always, always define unfamiliar or specialized terms. Another thing that might help you. What have we been doing at the beginning of every class session since we've been reading these? What do we start with? What did we start with today? What did we talk about before we started talking about Henry Rent at all? Yeah, we went back and looked at what the others 
we're arguing, right? What the other readings we're arguing for. So <clears throat> compare and contrast what you're reading with something that's already familiar. Right? Look back at things you've already done and see how it might relate to what you're doing now, right? Okay, where, where do they share ideas? Where do they differ, right? And, you know, on top of that, right, you know, remember we're also looking for repetitions, strands, and binaries, right? This whole essay was organized around a binary. So you need to try to identify what things are being opposed to each other in particular. Um, and uh, finally, I know I've said this before, but yeah, write questions and comments directly in the margins in your book. If you don't own the book, use sticky notes, right? If you don't, uh, you know, if you're working with a, a, a printout or whatever, then just, you know, write on the printout, right? Because, you know, one thing that you will get, even if you already have the book, from the PDFs I posted the other day, to keep everybody caught up until everyone does have the book, right? <clears throat> Look at the notes I make in the margins and try to imitate that kind of process yourselves. That will help you retain more of what you read, and it will help you to better understand what you're reading, right? If you're kind of having a conversation with it actively as you are reading, rather than sort of trying to passively absorb information. Because I think that, you know, one thing that we grasp from reading these five essays, right, none of which were easy, is that in order to get anything from it, you have to be actively trying to interpret and make meaning you are not going to grasp this by simply sort of trying to passively absorb. And that's really kind of the whole point of the class, right? So just try to make sure that you are working on that. Um, so remember that that draft of the first exploratory reflection is due tomorrow night. I will comment on it probably Saturday or Sunday. And then the final version will be due next Tuesday. And you're reading uh, chapter six and writing analytically for Tuesday as well. All right, so that is all I have for you. You are free to go. Uh, have yourselves a good weekend.